Let's stand together as we proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light because of his amazing grace. Let's sing about it. sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I found was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace
He's here today. He's here with you. If you've accepted Christ, you brought him with you when you came, and his presence never leaves you nor forsakes you. Amen. You can have that assurance because of the amazing grace of God. Let's sing about this. A simple chorus. Let it flow down. us because of your love, because of your compassion, and you've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We declare your praises because you've done this all. We pray you give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Amen. Thank you, Pastor Daryl and worship team. We are uh, going to be finish up for, finishing up First Peter chapter 1 this morning. You can be turning there in your Bibles. I want to just uh, go back to Trunk or Treat uh, from last night as we get started this morning and uh, just talk for just a second about why would we do an event like that. And I see some of the kids are headed to Children's Church right now. Uh, so if you are... If that's you, you guys can head that way. I think uh, Court and Hudson, are you guys got it this week? Awesome. Uh, praise the Lord for these young men that are be teaching the word to the kids this morning. But trunk or treat last night, why would we do an event like that? Um, and, I, and we see, to me, we see the reasoning in this passage that we're going to look at this morning. But we do it because we have been called to love. And this was one way that we can... Uh, love our community. It's a night where kids are going to be dressing up, they're going to be uh, looking for candy, and we have, we have the ability to do that. And so by inviting them in, we can show them what it's like to love as Jesus loved. Um, but more importantly than that, it's not just love, but we, were, we had those treasure maps that we were using last night, because in the treasure maps was the truth of the gospel. And that's really why we love. We have heard and we have understood and we have accepted the truth of the gospel and because that truth is changing our lives then we want to love others so we see this idea of love based on the truth in this passage that we're looking at this morning so that's kind of where we're um, the the things that we're going to be talking about this morning I just want to do a quick recap of first Peter chapter one before we read these last verses of the first chapter We've seen the work of the Father in our salvation. The first couple of verses says that he chose us for salvation. He talks about how the Father has, has and is keeping our inheritance in heaven secure for us. So we can, um, we can rejoice in that. We can praise God for that. We see the work of Jesus uh, through his death on the cross. It talked about the sprinkling of his blood, but it talked... Uh, also that as the pure and spotless Lamb of God, His blood cleansed us from our sins. So we, um, we take confidence in that as well. If you were a Jewish reader that was reading this, that Peter had uh, written in, the, in those early days, they were very familiar about needing a pure, spotless Lamb uh, for the forgiveness of sins. But we also, in the first chapter, we've been seeing the work of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification, first in our salvation, but then this process of becoming more and more like Christ. The Holy Spirit is at work in us as we obey the truth. So these are the things that we've been discussing, we've been working through uh, the last few weeks, and that brings us to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Um, I'm going to read through this whole passage, and then we'll, we'll study it together. Uh, let me pray first. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, um, my prayer is that your would be, word would be precious to us, that we um, would just hold it in high esteem and recognize the great value in your word. And Lord, as we look into it this morning, would you teach us, would you lead us and guide us, would you allow us to hear the truth that's in it? And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so 1 Peter 1, verse 22 says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good." When we start here in verse, 22, in verse 22, he says, having been purified by the truth. This is the salvation we've been talking about, I guess, for three weeks now. 
um, the salvation. We've been purified at salvation, this truth of the gospel that we first believed. Um, but we are also purified as we continue in obedience, walking our Christian life. So as we, we um, are approaching this passage this morning, assuming we've accepted the truth of the gospel, we are, we are becoming more and more like Christ as we yield to him, as we are obedient. Having purified your souls for obedience, excuse me, by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love. Now this little term brotherly love is the Greek word Philadelphia, which is where we get the city Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And the idea here is that there is a special love for family. And particularly, we're talking about our context is the Christian family. For those who have said um, yes to Jesus, yes to his, to believing in his death on the cross, you have become a child of God. And as children of God, we belong to the same family. And so as we obey uh, the scripture, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, um, this is going to result in a brotherly love for each other, um, a, a love that is similar to a family love. We should love one another as the, the church at large, but also here as the House of Prayer Church. There should be a special love that we have for each other. Um, and it should, and he continues and says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now he changes the word here when it's, it says sincere brotherly love with a sincere Philadelphia. And then he says, love one another earnestly, agape one another earnestly. Two different Greek words for love. They have a little bit different meanings. Um, so agape, uh, I've got a couple of definitions here to help us understand that. Agape love is the unconditional love that we receive from God the Father. Uh, most evident in our salvation, but also just evident in our everyday life. So agape love keeps on loving even when the loved one is unresponsive, unkind, unlovable, and unworthy. All right, Sarah gets lots of time to practice her agape love for me. <laughs> unkind. Uh, unlovable. This is, a, this is a special kind of love. This is a love that loves when the, the object of your love is not worth it. The object of your love is not loving you back. The object of your love, it's like you're just loving a rock. You're not getting anything back. You would continue to love anyways if you are loving with an agape love. Um, okay, another definition. Agape love uh, desires only the good of the one loved. It is a consuming passion for the well-being of others. So this isn't a love that, well, if I love Sarah, maybe she'll love me back. That's not agape love. It is a form of love, but it is not the purest form of love. The purest form of love is the love that God had us, that while we were still sinners, he would send his son Jesus, and Jesus died for us. That's agape love. And so, Peter here is telling us to agape one another earnestly from a pure heart, um, fervently, deeply, with commitment. Like it's not just a, oh, maybe I will, maybe I won't. If That's not agape love at all by the definition of agape love. So when we love someone with agape love, there's a, there's a, there's a passion about it. And this is um, a love that it says for one another. And so I want to talk about love, love a little bit here in the New Testament. It's a major New Testament theme that we should love one another. It just shows up over and over and over again. Now, when Jesus was talking to um, his disciples and some of the Pharisees, and they were questioning about what the greatest commandment was, what's the number one law, like what is the most important thing, and Jesus' response was the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your spirit. And then he added, in the second is like it, that you would love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus' uh, call to love, first God and then others, is a general call to love everyone. Because then, of course, they ask, well, who's my neighbor? And the parable of the Good Samaritan follows. And the, the point was, well, everyone is your neighbor. You should love everyone. But there is also a more specific command for Christians, 
that we should love each other in a special way. And when we see these love one another passages, a lot of them are specifically talking about Christians loving other Christians. And so John 13, 34 and 35, it kind of explains this a little bit better. Jesus here is here with his disciples. They are in the upper room. It is the night before Jesus is to be crucified and Jesus is giving them instruction. And Jesus said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. This is agape one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And this is why. This is why we agape love one another. This is why as Christians we should love other Christians with unconditional love. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So Jesus said, if you love one another, people will take notice. People will see that you love for each other, you you love each other, you care for each other, you have concern for each other in a way that's not natural. And that unnatural love, agape love, will point people to the Father. Because that type of love can only come from God. 1 John chapter 4, uh, we, we see some more uh, about love. And this is written by John. And again, each one of these is agape love. Beloved, let us love one another. Christians, let's love each other. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. All right, this special agape love, because it comes from God, you must be born of God to have this love. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us. This is how God showed his love to us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to have love for one another. He says this word beloved. This is, he's talking about family, family of God. If God loved us so much to send his son, we should love each other. That's not always easy to do, is it? But that's the way that God loved us, and that's the way that God calls us to love each other. Back to 1 Peter, uh, verse 23. So we are to love one another from a pure heart, and he gives us the reason why we should do that. Verse 23 says, because you have been born again. You've been brought into this family of God, which is why we should have Philadelphia love, brotherly love, family love for each other, but also this special agape love for each other. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. This first chapter has just been full of uh, contrasting the temporary with the eternal. And we see that Peter's doing it um, here again. Um, He says... We've been born again, we've been brought into the family of God, not with a perishable seed, not with a seed that doesn't last, not like um, something that fades away or that is corruptible or deteriorates, that's this earth, but we have been born of an imperishable seed. So our new lineage as members of the family of God is an eternal lineage, not of perishable but imperishable. Um, We are given a new DNA Right? It's God's DNA, which Scripture tells us when we've read, God is love. And that's how this agape love is in us, to love one another. We looked at, uh, two, a couple weeks ago, John 5.24, it says, We've been brought from death to life. This is a, this is a whole new thing. We are not uh, of the imperishable seed anymore, but the, uh, excuse me, not of the perishable seed, but of the imperishable seed. And this happens because we heard and responded to the living and abiding word of God. God's word is alive, and that's what changes us when we read it. That's how we're able to accept this truth of the gospel. Yes, it is the Holy Spirit working in us, but God's word is alive, and it works in us. Hebrews 4.12 describes a little bit how God's God's word pierces and works inside of us. The word of God 
is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. We don't just read the words and, and, and are unaffected by it. It affects us right into our soul and spirit of the joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. There's an interaction. When we read God's word, there is an interaction between us and the word. It penetrates into us. It changes us how we think. It changes our perspective. And it, God uses it to conform us to the image of his son. So God's word, it's living and it is abiding. It will remain. It has staying power. Earlier in, the chap- in, in chapter 1, we looked at it a couple weeks ago. We, we talked about God is keeping our inheritance in heaven for us. And it's imperishable. It is undefiled. It is unfading. Contrasting to our existence here on earth. We are strangers. We are exiles. We are foreigner- foreigners. This is a temporary existence. And here we have another contrast between the living and abiding word of God that remains forever and grass. Uh, Verse 24 says this, all flesh is like grass. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass wither and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news. It's the gospel that was preached to you. So uh, I think part Partly because we've been studying this chapter, but partly just it is fall. And I've just been reminded, it seems like every day, of the temporary nature of life. And if you say, Pastor Jeff, you talked about this the last three weeks, because it's in here every week when we open it up. But last week, we were just looking at the beauty of the leaves, right? And this week, where'd they go? They're gone, right? They'll come back, praise the Lord, but they, there was a season... For leaves, and that season um, is is over. And so I've been out in the yard and uh, cleaning those leaves from my gutters, raking them, blowing them, burning them. And I've just been out and around, and I noticed some other things. The landscape timbers that we edged the flower gardens with, I don't know, six years ago or something like that, five or six years ago. I noticed where last summer I stepped on some of them, and they just crumpled underneath the weight of my foot. And I noticed in some other places where I've been weed eating and the, like the, the, the wire of the weed eater is just like tearing into the side of those landscape, just tearing it apart. Why does it do that? They're rotting. Yeah, they don't last, do they? And uh, I've been, um, we, we've had a garden this, this summer for the first time in um, a vegetable garden in, in quite a while. And we grew tomato plants. And I love a f- fresh tomato sandwich. And I've just been so excited because the tomato plants, they look like they're dead. And they, they should have been dead a month ago. But there is still tomatoes on them. And I probably picked a dozen tomatoes this week. And I'm excited about that. Why? Because tomato season should have been over, right? Like that should have been done with. But it's just lasting just a little bit longer than normal. But I'm reminded... It's not going to, next week, after tonight, there won't be any tomatoes to pick, right? It's going to be too cold. That season will be over. Our human bodies have a lifespan. We talked about the Bob Ayers family and the Germain family and uh, the Van Wyck family. Loss of a loved one. Our bodies, they don't last forever. They are temporary. Our souls will last forever. But our bodies, this, these verses say, if we can go back to verse 24, these verses say our bodies like grass. Even like grass in all its glory, our bodies are amazing, they're beautiful. But the grass withers and the flower falls. But something does stay in forever, and what's that? It's his word. His word stands forever. James four thirteen and 14 helps to give us more perspective on this. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such town, spend a year there, and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. Amen, Phil? You don't know. What is your life? For you are a mist or a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. 
God's word will remain. Our inheritance in heaven is secure. We do have things that we can hold on to, but they're not things of this world. They are things of God. We have been born again, not of perishable seed, but imperishable through the living, abiding, and lasting word of God. I'm going to do a little side note because it really, uh, I think these verses really speak to it. We are in, in the middle of election season here in the United States. If you haven't voted, I encourage you to get out. You've got Tuesday to, is your last chance to vote. Uh, we will have a, a president, either um, Donald Trump or Joe Biden. We don't know who it will be, but one of those men will most likely be our president, and we'll, we will know shortly. And a couple of verses I want us to think about with that in mind and in the context of these verses. Romans 13.1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. doesn't matter who you vote for this week or who you have voted for, this is a verse for all of us. Continuing just a few verses down, it says, in this idea, government is instituted by God. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. And we might be tempted to say, well, I don't think they deserve my respect. I don't think they deserve my honor. These verses are telling us as our elected authorities, they do deserve our respect and our honor. As Christians, we can set the example in life and conduct, in how we interact with each other, in how we pay honor and respect to those whom the Lord has put an authority over us. I think of Daniel, um, in, in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament. Young Jewish boy, torn from his homeland. Probably watched family members, friends, neighbors, slaughtered. And carried off to a foreign land, put in as an exile. And he did pretty good for himself. He moved his way, his way up, but the bottom line was he was not living in his homeland. He was exiled. Um, their, their country was destroyed by the Babylonians, and years later, Daniel would say to the king, O king, live forever. How, how does Daniel do that? How do we pay honor and respect to someone we don't think deserves it? 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25, all flesh is like grass. And all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Whoever gets elected this week, in four years they'll be gone. But we'll still have this. And so we can take confidence in the, fact, in, in the things that do remain and hold loosely to the things that are temporary. Our inheritance is forever. The word is forever. And we know who gets the victory at the end of the day. If you're not sure, turn to the end of the book and read Revelation this week. The victory is the Lord's. Uh, Sam Amadi, I'm not sure who he is, what he stands for, but I do agree with this one sentence he made. Give your political party your vote, just don't give them your heart. Our hearts belong to the Lord. So we can take confidence in that. And we can honor whoever is instituted by God this week. All right, continuing, gonna, um, Pastor Jerry was here first service, and, um, and I said that we were going to uh, conclude in honor of Pastor Jerry in these last few verses talking about food, all right? <laughs> and, uh, and this is why we love one another, because of the truth of the word that we, um, that we understand, that we read. So verse, excuse me, chapter 2, verse 1 says this. In light of all that, this temporary life we're living, but God's word's remaining forever, our salvation is forever. He says, put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good." All right, so verse, verse 1 here of chapter 2. We are to put away. 
We are to set aside, we are to separate ourselves from these things as Christians who believe the truth in our attempt to love one another. So let's look at these things. Malice. This is just wickedness. Evil intent. And you think, well, Pastor Jeff, we're, we're at church. We're a bunch of Christians. If we did not need this instruction, if, excuse me, if we did not have evil intent in our lives at times, we would not need this instruction. This is us sometimes. We need to put it away. Deceit. How often do we try and hide something? Oh, it's just a little something. She doesn't need to know. He doesn't need to know. My boss doesn't need to know. My coworkers don't need to know. Put away deceit. Separate yourselves from it. Hypocrisy. Pretending to be someone you're not. Or claiming to believe something, but living your life contrary to that belief. All right, we're talking this morning about loving one another. As Christians, we are to love one another. If we're not acting in love, then we are acting in hypocrisy. If we claim to be a Christian. Put that away. Separate ourselves from it. Lay it aside. Envy. Is that next? Envy. Discontentment with what we have. Or wanting, seeing what someone else has and wanting it. Wishing it was ours. Longing for the bigger house, a newer car. Nicer this, bigger that. Being discontent with what, the, what God has given us. If we had nothing except for our salvation, we would have enough. We would be blessed. And then he concludes, he, he said, um, all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Making false statements about someone or making statements that damage somebody else's reputation. It's easy to watch, it's, it's election season, right? And so you, you're watching the commercials. The commercials are largely slander. Let's just be honest. And it's easy to see that, and it kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. Even if you don't like the person, you think, well, they probably shouldn't have been represented that way. But these verses are for us. These verse, this instruction is for Christians. Let's put it away. Separate ourselves. Lay it aside. Have nothing to do with these things. There's no, no room in our lives and in our vocabulary as Christians representing Christ for malice, for deceit, for hypocrisy, envy, slander. And, and what I love, and I, I mentioned it before, and I see it right here again, he tells us what not to do, but also tells us what to do instead. So verse 2 says, Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. So instead of speaking these words that bring death, we are called to desire God's word that brings life. And uh, newborn babes, we're, we've, we're so blessed right now. We've got young babies in, the, in, the, um, in our church. And when I think about babies, and it says, like newborn babes, we are to imitate these babies. Um, as they long for the mother's milk, we are to long for spiritual milk. We are to long for God's word. When I think about the babies... Their only desire is for milk, right? They don't want candy from last night. They don't want coffee. They don't want steak. They don't want salad, whatever you like. That's not what they're after. They want milk. That's it. They only have one desire. And another thing I notice about babies is they want it regularly. And they'll let you know if it's been too long. And um, I remember, John, I don't know if you remember, this summer, we were out, at, during camp, we were out there, and, and Hannah was somewhere, and John had their newborn, Bo, and he wasn't that old, and John was going to, I think you were going to change the diaper and feed a bottle or something like that, so John was getting stuff ready, he said, Jeff, do you want to hold him? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll hold him, so I had little Bo there, and, and I knew he was hungry because he was rooting, and I could not meet the need that he had. <laughs> but he was trying to, he, he, was, he was rooting on my, on my arm, and I'd pull him away, and he was just, he was back at it, you know? <laughs> they have one desire, it's for milk. They desire it regularly. They will not be satisfied with just once a week or once a day. They want it regularly. And then when they have 
When the baby, that young baby has drank the milk, they are completely satisfied, right? That's when they want to fall asleep. They, they, have no, they don't have another care in the world when they have received it. And Peter says we should, that's how we should be with God's word. It should be our first desire. We should desire it regularly. And when we, when we get it, when we read it and we study it, then we should be satisfied and feel like there is nothing else that we need. I'm not always a newborn baby when it comes to God's word. But Peter's saying that's how I should be. And some days and weeks and months I'm better at it, and other days and weeks and months less so. But this is, this is our goal, that we should desire it alone. We should desire it regularly. We should be satisfied when we have partaken of it. It's how we grow in our, in our salvation and in our sanctification. We become more holy as we understand his word, as we respond in obedience. The Holy Spirit working in us is making us more like Christ. And of course, he kind of tags on this challenge at the end, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. If you really call yourself a Christian, if you, really, if you say, yes, I have believed that Jesus died on the cross for my sin, then he said, this is what you should do. You should, you should desire God's word in the same way that a baby desires his, mother's, his or her mother's milk. And so that means that it can be done. You can say, well, I, I just don't have it. Then it, a first step, we pray and we confess, God, I don't have a desire for your word. God, give me a desire for your word. And then we take that step of setting that regular time aside so that we can get into it. I think it's neat that as Peter is challenging us here to desire God's word, he is using God's word to stir that up in us. And I said he quoted from Isaiah chapter 40 with that um, 20, uh, verse 24 as a quotation from Isaiah chapter 40. When he says here, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, he's referencing Psalm 34 verse 8 that says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. So Peter is using God's word to say to us, learn God's word, desires God's word, let it change your life. So we've kind of, we've concluded the first chapter and we've just started into chapter two. And I hope that you, along with me, I know I have just really enjoyed understanding more deeply the richness and the depth of our salvation and what God has done for us. This first chapter has repeatedly reminded us of the brevity and frailty of life. And, and, and for me, just observing nature and, and the, the deaths that we've had in our, in our church family just have been reminded of that brevity. And it, and it makes me think we hold, need to hold loosely to the things that are temporary, and we need to hold, to cling tightly to those things that are eternal. Jim Elliott, who was a missionary in South America, he understood this concept, and he, he gave his life in attempting to reach a tribal people with the gospel, and it was found in his journal to say, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. We can't lose that salvation. What we have here today, even this building, our bodies, are, are, they're temporary and they're fading away. But we do have something that will last forever. And as we desire his word, this is where we learn to love one another. We learn what it means to do that. We learn what it looks like to do that. We can follow Christ's example. We can understand the truth and then we can obey the truth. And so my challenge to, to us this morning is to desire the word and look for ways through our understanding of the word to love one another. Starting with our church family and then beyond the walls like we were doing last night with Trunk or Treat to those who need to know the gospel. We're going to close with a, with a song. Uh, Peggy's going to be available to, somebody else is available to pray. Joe and Linda are going to be available to pray this morning if you have a request, if you have a need. Uh, so neat, last night we had a, a prayer tent set up 
and uh, so many people just coming uh, and asking for prayer. And uh, we were able to do that with so many people this mor- or last night. And so anytime you have a, a request, uh, the altar is always open. We'll always have someone at the, at the end of service. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us first. We have the ability to love one another because you first loved us and you put your love inside of us when we became your children. And Lord, as we uh, grow in our desire for the truth and our understanding of the truth, um, Lord, help us to put your truth into practice, starting with how we love our family and then continuing in how we love our community and our friends and our neighbors. Uh, Lord, would you do that work in us? Because apart from you, we can do nothing. And uh, Lord, we just ask that from you this morning. Lord, um, we are, we're confident in, in the election because um, we know that you have a plan for uh, our nation, and we know that whatever that plan is, it's one of those temporary things, and it won't last, but you will last forever. Your word will last forever, and we praise you for that this morning. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. As we stand together, let's sing that chorus again, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, amazing love, now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to a tree, as grace flows down and covers me. sound amazing love now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree as grace flows down and covers me Thank you for your love that covers us. Go in that love in Jesus' name. Amen.